Okay. Where did that go? Oh, statistics. All right. So, although there are a lot of great statistics and kind of uh, packages to do really complicated stuff in R, we're going to cover mostly the basics today. Right? So a lot of the things that you want to do for bread and butter analyses, so correlations, correlation tests, t-tests, uh, rank sum tests, linear regression, logistic regression, proportion tests, chi-square tests, Fisher's exact tests. Okay? Um, so uh, I don't believe we actually ask as a prerequisite, but does that really, so are any of these terms very, very foreign to anyone other than maybe a rank sum test? Okay, good. That's a good thing, right? Um, so we're not talking about the theory or the formulas or anything like that. That is kind of for another class. We want to show you how to do some of these uh, in R. Sorry, this is a little bit small, so I'll uh, make it a little bit bigger. So core, so C-O-R, is the general function to just do correlations. Okay. Uh, so you just pass in an X and a Y vector, and then there's different options for what kind of data you use in order to get that correlation. Okay, so again, we're going to read in the circulator data set. Uh, using read R, read it in again, and we're getting, saying correlation between the orange average and the purple average, and we're going to use complete observations. So again, like almost other, all of the other summarization or statistical functions that we showed you, if something has missing, usually by default, it'll come out as NA. If you don't say NA to RN. The difference with core is that that is also true, but the, the way you get rid of missingness is a little bit different because there are different ways to get rid of uh, missingness with respect to um, a correlation. For the most part, if you want to just do the correlation on the complete observations, this is one of the ways. If you look at the help, right, it says... Everything, all observations, complete observations, missing or complete, pairwise complete observations. And in the details, it'll tell you exactly what one of those means. But more or less, uh, we just wanted to calculate the correlation of the complete observations. Now also, uh, another thing about kind of functions in some respects. So method is the, which correlation do you want? You want Pearson, Kendall, or Spearman correlation. Right? So by default, if you see something like this, it usually almost always picks, unless it's doing multiple operations, it picks the first one. If you don't set it by default. So in this case, since we didn't say anything about the method, it is going to give us a Pearson's correlation. Okay? So high correlation, pretty much when people are riding the bus, people are riding the bus. When it's high on the orange, it's high on the purple. Okay, so uh, a little bit deep liar. Uh, sorry, no. Uh, actually, we're using deep liar for a very specific reason here. We're actually only subsetting the columns that we want to do correlations over. But instead of passing in an x and a y vector into core, which we did on the last slide, you can also pass in a matrix or a data frame of numbers. Okay, so. We're reading in dplyr simply because we want to select all the columns that end in average. Okay, and this is a data set, so I'm going to call it averages. All right, so again, these two lines should be drilled in, hopefully, um, forever in your brain. It's about piping and selecting. And here, we actually pass this entire matrix, this entire data frame, into core. So it's got a bunch of rows and a bunch of columns. And we say, again, we want complete observations. And instead of giving, giving one number out, it gives us a correlation matrix. This function, signif, is just telling us I want to round it to three significant digits. Otherwise, these numbers might be really, really, really long. We didn't want to plot out, you know, 10 digits of a correlation. That's not very relevant, right? So we actually can see this is the orange average and orange average. And so on the diagonal, you'll see ones because the correlation with itself is always one. The back, so for example, the correlation between the orange average and the banner average is 0.5. And similarly, this is symmetric, so uh, similarly, orange average and banner average are 0.5. So this, uh, so instead of passing in x and y vectors, you can pass in an entire matrix, and it'll do the correlations of all the things in there. 
Now, note, uh, we can't put, I, it will not like it when you put in something that's non-numeric into those columns to make sure the things we subset, in this case, were all numeric, right, when we did the correlation. So I think you're just, why is there a three? So I just wanted to round it to three digits. It's three significant digits for printing. Um, but significant is important if you want to, if you're going to present results and stuff like that. So there's a round function, there's a signif function to kind of rounding, rounding out or rounding to significant digits of, of a number. So for example, p-values or correlations or something like that. Can I yes. Like for example, if you are calculating a correlation and you want to see like the p-value, so you, if I use core test, I have the p-value. Do you know if there's a specific command where I have like the p-values of the correlation and matrix? I don't believe you. I don't believe that's possible. To, okay. or, uh, so there, so we'll get to core.test in a minute, it, and so for testing correlations, but um, I think you have to do all pairwise yourself. I don't think there is a global. Yeah, there's an approximation, but you want to be uh, a little, that's, yeah, so there's a Fisher R to Z transformation, actually. So uh, if you, for things very close to one or zero, it's not a good approximation, but for the majority, the arctan transformation, uh, you, there's a formulation that you just say, change it, it's more or less, it's more or less normally distributed, you can use standard normal on there. Yeah? So when you import, for example, Uh, maybe. Uh, it depends what you mean. So sometimes, if it looks blank in Excel, it's not blank, right? It could have spaces. It could have a bunch of spaces in there. And depending on the read underscore CSV, the option that you put in there, it may treat it as NA. It may not. Also, sometimes, although they look blank, there are actually white space characters in there that aren't technically spaces. And I don't believe it will remove them. But for the most part, uh, it it should. I believe with read underscore CSV, not with read dot CSV. Um, but also, I would never trust that. I would just do a table, and if I see a so, for example, if you do a table, let's 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 uh, let me do X is So if you see something like this, and we did a table on x, right, we could also do unique x. Right, we see that there are things in there with just empty strings. Also with this, when we ran this table, like before with a named vector, this is actually a table, and these are the names, right? x, y, and z. And in this case, this name is just an empty string. So, all, so for the, for, to answer your question, Usually, if it's just empty spaces, it will convert them to NAs when it reads it in. But if there's something else kind of going on, or if you do change the defaults and read underscore CSV, it may not so automatically. Yes. So, so R will never save you from data cleaning. <laughs> That's nothing, nothing to my knowledge will. So for most projects that I work on, I would say 80% of the time is data cleaning, and then 20% is like statistics. Right? And I'm a statistician, so I, that is that is not an uncommon, uh, I think, breakdown. Uh, I think, a, a, for example, a, a fellow student of mine took over a year to clean an entire data set um, because it was from like 80 different sources and it was some very uh, sensitive data so she couldn't actually get help from anyone else. It was, it was actually uh, salaries for people in this university, so... That came in and was a little, a little strange. So uh, it might it just takes time sometimes. Uh, hopefully not a year, but so okay. So right now I'm going to select. I'm going to make two different data sets. One of them being the orange average. One of them being the purple average. And then I'm also going to take the green average and the banner average in two separate data sets. So so I showed you once. We passed in two vectors. It gave us one correlation. I, pa I, I passed in one matrix. It gave us a correlation matrix. You can also pass in two matrices and it will give you a correlation matrix but not necessarily of all combinations so when we pass in op and gb so the orange purple the green and the banner it'll give us a correlation matrix but only of these two columns with these two columns okay 
So you can do kind of any pair, any kind of combination of that to get whatever correlation matrix you want. Um, if worse comes to worse, you could always default to just doing the pairwise uh, correlations if you want to be specific. And again, we're just rounding things off just so we can print them. So uh, core.test will do tests on correlations. Are they significant or not? Um, and so, for example, instead of passing in the two vectors, I believe this function, though, uh, like we just discussed, you have to actually pass in two vectors, not two matrices, or, or one matrix. So I'm going to assign CT for core test. Uh, that's why it's called CT to the uh, output of core.test. Uh, for the orange average, the purple average, again, we're going to use the complete observations. And this is the output, very similar to a t-test, which we're going to about to get to in a second. But it says this is the uh, correlation that we're testing, uh, the data that was put in there, the t-statistic for this correlation, the degrees of freedom, the p-value. And again, we talked about uh, what that's represented by and all that kind of stuff. The alternative hypothesis, the true correlation is not equal to zero, the 95% confidence interval for that correlation, and the estimated correlation of these two vectors. So it kind of has all the information that you had with core, but a lot more. But sometimes you just want the correlation. You don't want all this other stuff outputted. You just want to get an estimate. So again, similarly, uh, like we had with the t-statistic, this isn't technically a list. It was, an, it was a testing object. But again, you can think of it as a list. And when we say names, on this list, it'll tell you all the names of the elements of that list. So, for example, and we and because they are named, we can say CT dollar sign the element name. So, in this case, if we do CT dollar sign statistic, it'll give us back the the number, right, which is seventy three point six. And actually, here uh, it's a it's a named vector again, and it tells you this is a T. And again. Although, it's one of my pet peeves, p-value it says is zero, um, but it's really, really, really small. So you would just say lower than some kind of rather arbitrary threshold. Uh, so that is one way you can extract data from some of these testing objects. But we're going to talk about a package called Broom. So uh, although it's, I think it's a great package, it is a little bit confusing because there is a function called tidy in Broom, because the whole package is you're supposed to tidy up your data, right? As, we, as you can see, some of these some of these package names and conventions are are very very cute in some ways. Uh, but the reason I think it's a little bit confusing, there is a tidy R package that does not have a function called tidy. The tidy function is in the Broom package, but they do very different things. So tidy R is about reshaping your data and data manipulation. This is about tidying data objects that aren't data frames into data frames in R. So in this case, that CT object, right, is just is a testing object which you can reference things by dollar sign, CT dollar sign statistics, CT dollar sign estimate, all those names that we've shown on the last slide. And that's great and all, but sometimes you want to be able to use dplyr. Sometimes you want to be able to work with this as it's like a data frame, and I don't want to have to go through um, and convert this myself. So when you say tidy on it, and I'll call it tidy underscore CT, what it does is it takes all those statistics, it takes that, that object, and it converts it into a data frame. It just has one row, but each of the columns now represent all the elements within that data set that we had shown on the last slide. Okay? So tidy is just a way from getting your data, or getting an object that usually is an output, a test, a model, into a format that is a data frame, that you can actually run things a little bit easier, run, run dplyr commands and subset things easier. So we're going to be using this over and over again uh, for the objects that we see out here. Um, so there are other functions in Broom. More or less all I use is tidy, and it, it can take in a whole bunch of different objects. So sometimes you actually want to put the statistics on your plot. Right, so here we say text. We're just saying paste is zero. Again, paste. Paste by default if you, will allow you to paste strings together, concatenate strings together. Paste's default is to separate things by spaces. Paste zero is to say, just jam them together. I don't want you to, by default, put any spaces in there. So again, we want to paste. 
the letter R equals, and then we're going to round the significant digits to 3 for the estimate of the correlation. So all we're doing is saying R equals 0.92. That's all we're doing up here in text. And here in base, we're going to plot the orange average versus the purple average, and we're going to label the axes better. We're going to make the main, uh, the title better. We're going to change the axes to be a little bit bigger so they're more readable. We're going to change the labels so they're a little bit bigger, and we're going to make the, the main title uh, twice as big. And then uh, the legend command can actually allow you, will allow you to, there's a legend command, and there's also a text command, allow you to add text to that plot. So, um, if you would take a wild guess, we didn't show you how to just do that with base. We showed you how to do that in ggplot. Again, uh, the circulator data set, orange average, purple average. Um, we're doing a qplot, so by default, it'll plot points. And then there's an annotate function in ggplot2 that says, I want to annotate this by text. Where do you want to put it? I want to put it at 4,000 on the x, 8,000 on the y. What is the label that you want to put? Again, r equals 0.92. This, that's all this label represents. And I want to make it size 5. I can make it size 20 if I want to make it bigger, so, so on and so forth. So you can put, for example, you, if you put a linear regression, you could put the equation up here, the R, R value, the correlation, the R squared, and the P value, whatever kind of text you want to annotate on there. Okay, So it takes an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, um, the label that you want to put in there, and the size if you're annotating with text. You can annotate with other things like rectangles and stuff like that, but we're not going to show any of that. Is that code clear? Sorry, how does it know that the R is the label that you want? So text, I saved it as just an object from the previous slide. So, yeah. All right. So similarly with t uh, core test, there's t-test. So... Um, one of the big differences, well, they're doing different tests, but also with t-tests, you can pass in just one vector. And that'll do a t-test as to whether the mean is equal to zero, right? So that's the alternative hypothesis. By default, it will give you a, uh, it will give you a, um, sorry, uh, it'll give you the, the alternative hypothesis. Um, by default, it also assumes t these are two samples, they're not independent if you put in two vectors, right? So in this case, uh, we're testing whether the orange average is equal to the purple average, right? And we're doing that mar marginally, so we don't care that they're paired by day, right? We're not treating it paired in any way. So what it'll give you is, a, well, it's two sample t-tests. We just think these are two samples. It tells you the data. It tells you pretty much everything that you had before, except here it is a confidence interval on the difference, right, in means. And this is the mean of x and the mean of y. It doesn't give you the standard deviations, however, uh, but it also is a, it, it's it's an okay test or it's an okay function to give you the output. But again, this this tt object will give you uh, the things that you want, or it give you very similar output to the correlation test. Right. So this testing object will have statistics, parameters, p values, confidence intervals, estimates, the null value, alternative method, and the data name. Okay. So, similarly, with broom, you can just say tidy, and it'll tidy it up. So it'll actually give you a data frame where you could subset the specific columns that you want with dplyr syntax and select, right? Um, you can reshape this with gather or spread. Similarly, like we did before, it's just, stand, it's just a regular data frame. It just happens to have um, statistics in, in the columns. So really quickly... Um, my apologies, I feel I don't believe we actually showed you. So I'm gonna show you, I'll make this a little bit bigger. So the argument paired paired equals true. We'll do a paired t test. Right, so in this case, it's, it's treating these as two separate samples. Here, it's treating these as paired. They have to have um, they have to have the same exact, you know, they have to have the same 
number of rows for a paired t-test. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. In, the, in this two-sample case, that could be you know, the ages for men and the ages for women, which don't have to be the same size. And so if we look, this is the exact output that we had on the slides from the non-paired t-test. And here, it actually does tell you that the test is, is paired. It tells you it's different. And alternative hypothesis is the true difference in means is not equal. Um, which is, is true, but the alternative is really that the mean of the differences are, zero, are not zero, right? Whereas we're saying, for example, the mean of the men, age, the age, mean age of the men, and the mean age of the women is not the same, versus saying if we had taken the differences, in this case, right, if it was a match case control, we would subtract off each one, each pair first, on the ages and then do a t test on that, right? So paired equals true will allow you to do a paired t-test. And again, you can tidy it up with tidy. So um, there is an alternative way that you can actually specify uh, t-tests in the formula syntax. So what we're going to do, again, now we're going to bring in tidy r, which again, does not have a tidy function. They're, very, they're separate packages. They do separate things. Um, we're going to create a long data set. Again, we're just going to take the orange average, the purple average, and this is important for selecting only those two columns. Um, and then we're going to gather those columns together. We're going to make a column called line, and we're going to, uh, the, the ridership that we actually put in there, we're going to call that column average, and we're going to drop the date uh, So when we gather up those columns. We want to gather up these two columns. So we just, we could have said gather column one, column two here. We just said for a quicker way, I just don't want. I want to gather everything but the date. And so what you do, you can do here is t dot t test. Sorry, t t equals t dot test average tilde line, and you specify the data set. So this is very similar to the form. This is the formula syntax that we're talking about here and there, where the y it's y tilde x, specifically in a t test, line can only have two levels in the factor. Okay. It can only have two levels. That's why we had. That's why it's very important only to select these two columns. Okay. So again, if we run tidy, it's the exact same output that you had on the last slide. Uh, that does the mean of x and the mean of y. Uh, the one thing, yeah. So it's just a different way. If your data is long, this is the way you would do it. If your data was wide, this would be the way you did it. Okay. All right, so uh, we're not going to necessarily show you ANOVAs uh, for the most part. Uh, the ANOVAs that you want to do are, you can think of them as a linear regression. So we're going to talk about linear regression very briefly. Right, I'm going to put a little bit of notation here. So Y is your outcome. I indexes per person, so you have a bunch of, so you have a different observation for each person right, for their outcome. And that's equal to some intercept we're going to call alpha plus your beta coefficient, your slope, if you're thinking of it as a line, uh, some other factor x, which could be binary, which could be continuous, and then some error term. Okay, this should be just simple linear regression. So again, the formula syntax is called that for a reason uh, because it kind of was derived in a lot of respects from the linear models uh, function that we're going to talk about. And it's y tilde x. y is a function of x. All right. So the LM function is the linear model function that we're going to use. So in this case, we're going to say fit equals, we want to run a linear model. The outcome is the average. The x predictor is line. And it's equal. And the data we're using is the long data set. So this is exactly equivalent to the two sample t tests we've run before. So when, when you're doing a linear regression with only an indicator variable and there's only two groups, it's exactly a, a two-sample t-test. So fit, if we print it out, it'll give us the intercept, the average, and the call. So what did, what, what did you actually pass into this function? And what is the intercept? What is the, the beta coefficient? OK, so the intercept is alpha. Uh, this line purple average is beta. So it doesn't name your, your 
beta coefficients, I would say that well. Uh, but also, you don't see any t-statistics, you don't see any p-values, none of that kind of stuff. Uh, by default, when you just fit the model, it doesn't calculate those. Uh, the summary command will do that. So when you have a model fit, you say, I want the summary of that. That's when it calculates the t-statistics, the p-values, the standard errors, and all that kind of stuff. Okay? So it also gives you some other things so that I don't think are particularly useful. So the idea is it gives you the residuals, um, the quantiles of the residuals. Uh, you're supposed to be able to look at those numbers in some respects and see if it's symmetric or not, right? Because the error should be rather normally distributed. You can just plot the residuals rather than doing that. So it also gives you uh, significant codes. Don't use these. I mean, make your own decisions about the true effect size and the p-value, right? Don't just go with, oh, that's a star, that thing's significant. Let's publish if it was a really, really small effect. It tells you how many observations are deleted. Uh, so, you know, remember, there's some missingness in this data. Uh, and it tells you the degrees of freedom and all that kind of other stuff. So uh, when you actually look at, so SFIT is our, is our summary of our fitted model. So what do we got? We got a call, we got terms, we got sigma, we got all these kind of things. For the most part, the biggest thing I think you want out a lot of times is the coefficients. With the standard errors, with the t statistics, that is in the coefficients column. So you can technically grab that, grab that element with shorthand, so you can say coef rather than the full thing coefficients. There's also a function called coef. So let me actually run this model really quickly. I don't run the summary. And we'll go back to that slide in a minute. Uh, I had to reshape it. So let's make averages. All right. So, yeah. Okay. So we got this fit. We got S fit. Summary. I could say coef s fit to get the coefficients. Also, we could have done coefficients. It gives us the same exact thing out there. Uh, so you can run coef on the fit as well to just get the straight coefficients. But it doesn't give you all those fun things of the p values and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's also a residuals. I'm going to plot this, but, or I'm going to print this, but it's not going to be fun. It's just going to give us all the residuals from that model that you would gather out. So there are functions that will access um, a lot of these different elements. Um, but I'm going to show you two ways to kind of plot the, plot the I would say, some of the standard plots to, see, to do some model checking. And then also the tidy function, when you just pass it on the original model, We'll do that summarization for you and get it, give it, give it to you in a rather nice data frame. All right, so it says tidy it. It gives you a column for term. It gives you the estimate. It gives you the standard error, the statistic. It doesn't tell you that it's a t statistic though, and it gives you the p value. So if you want to do subsetting, manipulation, all that kind of stuff, or tabling for your paper, right? This would be a nice way to do it. So uh, we're going to read in some of the some car data. So I think we've spoken about this car data here and there. So it's, you know, indications whether it was a bad buy or not. So some of these lemon cars, it's got information about the vehicle, like the cost, the odometer values, right? So how long has it been driven, that kind of stuff. So we're just going to play with some of this for some of the, the rest of the lab or the lecture. So let's look at the vehicle odometer value by vehicle age. So again, the big difference between what we did in the last uh, slide and what we did here is before... Line type was a character, right? So you can pass in a character on the right-hand side, and it's okay. What that will do in the background is it will make it a factor, okay? So again, all the rules about factors apply. So if you, I would say to be safer, also to always look at your data, always look at your data, always look at your data, you should probably be recoding factors yourself. 
before just putting them in a model. Um, if you don't know the levels of a factor and you're about to fit a model, you should stop and reevaluate uh, what's kind of going on with your data. I would say this is like the modeling part is way later, I think, in, after the exploration. So, for example, I've run, I've run uh, some sessions in the consulting clinic here for a few years uh, when I was a student and, and until very re recently. And I've had students and, and uh, researchers come in and say, I want to do a multi-level logistic regression with these two factors and all this kind of stuff and very, very complicated models. And we, we ask very simple questions like, have you run a two-by-two two table on the outcome and the main predictor that you want? And if their answer is no, we kind of step them back and say, these complicated models are great, but sometimes they aren't going to give you much more information. Sometimes. They will. They'll give you adjusted estimates. But if you see, for example, if you want to see an effect of gender and men and women have the same probability of outcome, I don't care what model you have, you're not going to see an effect for the most part. Unless you have gross imbalances in your groups, and that should be more concerning than comforting, than that after you do adjustments, you do see some sort of effect. So I'm saying exploration is really a huge part of the process, um, even though it's the come to, sometimes you're in the dredges cleaning data and doing that. So here it's different. Age is no longer a categorical variable. It's no longer a character. It is a factor. Or sorry, it is a continuous measure. So here we're doing the uh, relationship on the odometer value with the age. So do older cars have more miles on it? That's what we're, we're asking. And so uh, the intercept here, you can interpret that as the, the average odometer value when the vehicle is zero years old, right? Right. So when it's new, it has 60,000 on there. So that's actually pretty, really high. Um, I don't know why that – or maybe – I don't know if it was z zero, maybe zero from the, the, the buying – zero years after the buying. I don't know why. That's a really high estimate. And then for every year, they said on average they put around 2,700 miles in there. And that look, sounds low to me too. Um, okay. So uh, we, so the AB line function in base will allow you to do a – will allow you to put on a regression line on a plot. So I should have done some editing here, but I didn't. So – we're going to plot the odometer value on the y-axis by the vehicle age, and we're going to jitter. So there's also a jitter function that will jitter the points left and right. So they're not all plotted on one straight line, so we actually want them to spread out a little bit. Uh, we're going to use the cars data set. Again, we're going to change the points to be actual filled-in circles. We're going to change the color a little bit. We're going to take them to be black, but we're going to put some alpha leveling in there. So it's a 5% alpha level so that you have to have more or less 20 points on top of each other to be a full black uh, dot. And so this just allows you to see, for example, towards the edges, towards these values here, there isn't as much data as in right here. So that's why we're doing some alpha blending. Um, and again, we're changing some labels around. But A, B line, and you put in a linear model, you can put other options. But pretty much this line here, A, B line fit, will put this linear regression line on top of everything. And I'm not going to go through this right here. This is the exact same thing that we had before, but instead we're doing box plots instead of these jittered scatter plots. So with ggplot2, uh, it's a little bit harder to pass in a linear model that you've already fit, but if you just want a regression line, it's very, very, very easy. So again, you do x is age, y is odometer. This is the cars data set. Again, I want to do some jittering. I want to change the alpha level to be a little bit lighter so we can see where the data really is at. Uh, I don't want to jitter in the y direction. I already think, I know the vehicle odometer's age, or the vehicle's odometer is correct. I just want to, I just want to jitter around the age because otherwise these are just categories and they'll be online on top of each other. And then I can add a smoother. So you say geom smooth, and we want to say the method equals LM so that I want to add a smoother. I want to add some summary of this data in a line, and I want to use a linear model, which will fit a linear model on X and Y, and then also I don't want the standard errors, more or less, and this will show us the general direction the fit of, if your car is older, this is the uh, odometer's, uh, this is the, the measure of the odometer. Okay. 
Now, uh, pretty much, we did simple linear regression with a categorical variable. We did it with a continuous variable. The only extension, really, is uh, uh, multiple linear regression. So, not surprisingly, I would think, right, if it's a, it's a formula and you kind of think of formulas with utility and all that kind of stuff, y utility x1 plus x2 is the format that you would put in to put in multiple factors, multiple things into your linear model. So in this case, let's do, <clears throat> let's try to estimate the effect of vehicle age after adjusting for whether this car is a bad buy or not. All right? And so, again, you know, I think through your, your classes, it should be, you know, this is the effect of age with a one unit increase, holding everything else constant. That would be, for example, the, the uh, interpretation of that beta coefficient. So one unit increase in age, holding it, holding constant, whether it's a bad buy, on average, you have around 2,600 additional, um, so 2,600 miles on your car for every unit increase in year. So um, added variable plots are usually some ways you actually assess whether relationships are linear for predictors after adjustment. So uh, let's say you're like 10, let's say you looked at you know, x and y, and they look linear. It's great, right? But then you adjust for like five other things, and it's not linear anymore, or it might not be linear. You're not really sure. Right? That's one of the assumptions of linear regression, that the effect of x on y is, a lot, is linear. So what if it's curved after you adjust for your gender or you adjust for, you know, hat size? I don't know. Then you want to do some added variable plots to allow you to maybe, S, to maybe see that relationship. So again, these aren't, so I apologize, these are not the probably best predictors, best continuous measures to kind of see a, lot, a linear relationship. But the AV plots function in the car package uh, will allow you to kind of do an added variable plot. So this is, so uh, let's see if I can make this a little bit smaller. So what it says down here is, is bad by give uh, with a pipe others versus vehicle odometer given others. So this is saying, look at the effect. Sorry, not that. Look at the effect of is a bad by after holding all the other variables constant versus regressing the vehicle odometer on every other variable but is bad by and see if this relationship is kind of linear. Um, one thing I would note here, if this was the effect, like it looks pretty flat, so it doesn't seem like after adjusting for the vehicle age, uh, it doesn't seem like there's a huge effect of uh, whether it's a bad buy or not on the odometer measure. Even though you have a very significant, very significant difference. All right, so there is a, okay, so we got linear regression, we've done a few things, done some added variable plots, got the summaries. If you run tidy on that, it'll just give you a tidy data set with more than, more than the rows, or more rows, one row for each of the uh, estimates, so the intercept for the odometer value and the age. So there is uh, some other things that you want to do to check for the quality. So residuals, for example, versus the fitted, so they shouldn't have any discernible shape, the uh, uh, quantile quantile plot shows how well the residuals fit a normal distribution and the Cook's distance measures the influence of individual points. So the one function I would or the one thing, if you're going to do anything in base, if you say plot on a linear model, it'll give you four plots out. So uh, it'll do the residuals versus the fitted. Actually, let me just do, let's do them here. Okay, so if I say plot fit to, what it's going to say, what, if I, I don't say a specific option, it's going to say do a plot, and it's going to ask me for the next one. Uh, your margin is too large. So it'll give me the residuals versus the fitted, right? So here's the fitted values, here are the residuals. You shouldn't necessarily see a large shape, any curvature, or anything like that in, in this line here. We do see, for example, that there may be some uh, not linear effect um, going on when the 
the fitted values are less than 7,000. So there might be some sort of relationship that is a little bit different for uh, old, uh, younger, uh, younger cars, I guess, cars that have fewer years on them. And the quantile quantile plot is trying to say the residuals that we have, how close are they to normal? If they were truly normal or if they're completely normal, they should, they should fit on this line as much as they can. Right? So, they, so what this is plotting is quantiles from the normal versus quantiles from your data. And, some, and usually a lot of the deviances have within the tails. And if there's large deviances there, there could be some uh, pr like problems with fitting that model in some of the tails of the data. So like really, really older cars or really, really uh, young cars, for example. And then if you click invalid graphic state. So if you get margins too large, so I'm going to, that sometimes will happen, for example, because um, because I've zoomed into the, uh, zoomed in, zo sorry, not not use the zoom function, but actually zoomed into my uh, RStudio so I can make it bigger on the screen. All right, so here's the residuals versus fitted. QQ plot. Uh, fitted versus standardized residuals. So if you see a standardized residual way, way above, like two, for example, right? These are these are kind of mapped, not mapped to like a normal distribution, but you can see. You can kind of think of like values in this are kind of like like normal ish, right? So if things are above three, that's really a low probability of happening in a normal distribution. So there probably are some points in that data set that could potentially really drive the effect of the entire uh, relationship. So this is also a, a, a way to measure that called leverage. So more or less, think of it this way: if you had something where you were predicting, you are trying to look at some outcome based on age. And you had someone that was, everybody was 20 to 30, and then one person was 100. That person who's 100 is going to drive that. And you think of it on a line, right, just X versus Y. And you got to point all the way over here. That person over here, whatever their outcome is, can potentially really drive the regression. And so that's what this is doing here, is trying to identify, for example, out of this data set, the 30,926 row could potentially be a highly influential point, right? Alrighty, doing another one. Why not? Another. No. Uh, so you can actually explicitly uh, specify that things uh, are factors. Uh, one thing I'll say, if you do that, it does make these names really, really ugly, but once you tidy it, make it into a data frame, you can do string manipulation on these. And just take out the things that you don't want, Make it into a nice little table. Uh, now, lastly, GLMs, generalized linear models, are almost the same exact thing, right? The only difference is two things. Uh, one, you use the GLM function versus the LM function, and you usually specify you should specify the family. So binomial, Poisson, like negative binomial, that kind of stuff. A lot of times, what people are using is binomial for a logistic regression. So if you use a GLM, again, y tilde x, you can and you do addition with the x's if you want to do multiple linear multiple regression, the data set, and then when you say family equals binomial, and you say I want to do a logistic regression. This data is a binomial variable. Now when you say that though, this thing better just have zeros and ones or trues and falses in there. You could still have missing data and it'll drop that missing data, but you shouldn't have the number five, for example, in there. Otherwise logistic regression doesn't make any sense. So also, when you get the summaries out, you get the summaries, you get the estimate standard errors, P Z values in this case instead of T values, and the probability, the P value, sorry. And again, you can run tidy, and it'll give you the tidy version of that. Note, though, the estimates that you get are not on odds ratio scales. These are on the native scales for whatever family you fit. 
So for example, binomial, these are log odds or log odds ratios. For Poisson or a log link, those are log relative risks or log relative rates. Okay? So these these are these the p values are still correct, but if you want to report odds ratios, you have to do the exponentiation yourself. Okay. Um, so the so this represents the log odds, and this one, this is the log odds ratio for a one unit increase in the odometer uh, versus whether it's a bad buy or not. So it doesn't really seem so. One, this might not make much sense. Like this is saying putting one mile, one additional mile on your on your uh, on your car. Maybe you probably want to divide that number by like ten thousand or a thousand, so that the interpretation of this coefficient is if you add a thousand miles to your car, ten thousand miles to your car, because adding one additional mile, yeah, of course it's a really small effect, right? Because you won't you wouldn't think like, oh, I got to forty thousand and one, now it's a bad car. Right? You, so you pro you want to the interpretation depends on the original units of the data. But if you add, for example, another year, so if you have you're driving your car this year versus next year, you're thirty percent more likely to have a bad car. Or let's say you got you had two cars in the lot, same exact car, one is a year older, it's thirty percent more likely to be a bad car compared to the one that's younger. All right, so again, there's all a bunch of other packages for mixed effects modeling, nonlinear regression, that kind of stuff. We're not going to cover those. LM and GLM, right, are the majority, I would say, of the, of the analyses you want to do. For, excuse me, there's another package called GEE pack or GEESE. -E. So there are multiple versions, again, to do some of these more... Um, these extended models, right? So a generalized, uh, a fitting a model with a generalized estimating equation or a random effects model. There are specific packages out there that will do that. We're not going to cover them, but they are out there. So prompt.test. We'll do a test on proportions, right? So you give it uh, more or less a table or you give it uh, how many outcomes you had versus the entire sample size. And um, it does a test whether the null probability is equal to something, and if you don't specify p, it assumes that it's a fair uh, uh, outcome, so it checks whether the probability is 0.5. So let's say we had 15 cases out of 32. So 32 people got, 32 people we measured, 15 of them got cancer. Is the probability of cancer, for example, 50%? This is the output you get. And again, it's very similar to every single output we've gotten from a testing function so far, so you can tidy it, all that kind of stuff. It gives you estimates. Um, if you pass in a table, you can do a, sorry, if you pass in a table, which we'll do on another slide, into X, like a two by two table, it'll do a two sample test of proportions. Um, and so you can do prop.test. For a lot of categorical data, what you're going to be doing, if there, for rows and columns, if you're tab tabulating a categorical variable versus a categorical variable, You'll be using chi-square.test, or what? on the next slide we'll talk about Fisher's exact test. So again, what we're going to do here is we're making a two-by-two two by two table specifying whether it's a bad buy uh, versus if it's an online sale. So this is the table that we get. right? So chi-square.test, we're going to pass in this table, and we're going to show you the output. So CQ is chi-square.test, so it says chi-square.test with a continuity correction. And it's going to say, this is the chi-squared value, this is the degrees of freedom, this is the p-value. So it's saying that there isn't large, strong evidence that, um, so, sorry, the, the null hypothesis is that the rows and the columns are independent, right? So is the car being a bad buy independent of whether it's an online sale or not? It doesn't seem strong evidence against that, right? And again... Like every other test we've shown you so far, there's statistics, parameters, p-values, all that kind of stuff, and you can extract things using the dollar sign, or you can tidy it up. So, um, if you do, if you also do a two by two table and put it in prop.test, it will do the same. So these are actually equivalent, as you see with the p-values, the degrees of freedom, and the, and the statistics. But prop.test with a two by two table will do a two two sample 
Test and proportions. And then lastly, a lot of times, or more or less generally, if you have a table, I almost always do Fisher's exact test. The only times when I don't really do Fisher's exact test for a contingency table, where it's 2 by 2, 2 by 3, 3 by 4, 4 by 5, the only times when I really do a chi-square test is when the counts within the table are really, really, really high. Right? So otherwise, Fisher's exact test will test whether the rows and the columns have the same distribution or proportion, or that the rows and the columns are independent. And so again, you pass in a table, and I'll do a two sample, to, uh, I'll do a, um, in this case, it, it's a two by two table, so it's testing whether the odds ratio is one or not, right? Are they independent? Pretty much the null hypothesis is still the same. Are they independent, yes or no? And it gives us a p-value, it gives us some estimates. So Fisher's exact test, chi-square test, um, prop test, core test, t-test, we'll all do the testing. LM does linear models, GLM does generalized linear models. So, really briefly, I'm going to run over these really quickly. In R, there's also ways to generate random data to do simulations and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, for almost any distribution you can think of, there is a set of functions that are useful. So, uh, I'm going to go. So, some of the uh, ones that are already implemented: the normal, the binomial, the beta, the exponential, the gamma, and the hypergeometric. So, in every one of those functions, it has an R, a D, a P, and a Q function. Corresponding to that, so R norm generates random numbers. D norm calculates, you know, some number. How does that correspond to the density of the normal distribution? P, which is the other one that you usually use for P norm. So it's saying, like, let's say I have a, a statistic Z, right? Let's say in a paper you said the Z statistic was 1.6, and they gave you a P value and said those don't seem to line up. You'd say P norm. Right, 1.6, and you, it'll tell you uh, actually the probability up until that point. So the probability of less than or equal to 1.6, and you can say if you want the upper end greater than 1.6. Q norm, and say you know what is the what is the 95th quantile of the normal distribution, right? So or the 97.5, which you should know is around 1.96. So if you say Q norm. 1.9, or sorry, Q norm, uh, 0.975, 97th percentile, it'll give you back 1.96. So these are just the opposites of each other. If you put in P norm 1.96, it'll give you 97.5. So generally, there, there are ways to kind of generate random data if you want to do simulations and stuff like that. Sample. Sample will do uh, permutations or subsamples of data, depending on how, what you want it to do. You pass in a vector. You say how many things you want. And if you say replace equals true, it'll sample with replacement. If you say sample equals false, it will do, sam it'll do um, sampling without replacement. If you don't specify any of this stuff and just say sample 1 to 10, it'll just give you the, a permutation of 1 to 10. In this case, I want to sample five numbers from 1 to 10. And that's what we get out. And lastly, if you want to sample data sets, because data sets are too big, you just want to plot a subset of it just uh, because over plotting. You can use sample in the subsetting command. You want to sample the number of rows. I want to sample 10,000. dplyr also has two functions that allow you to sample n, right? You say cars, I want to sample 10,000 rows from that. Or you can sample a fraction of the data. So in this case, out of the cars, I want to sample 20% of the data. And then you can do your plots and all that kind of stuff. All right, Whew. statistics, yeah. All right, before we move on to the lab and a break, um, any questions about statistics or like, I want to do this model, can you do it in R? I want to do it. So again, there's other things like factor analysis and stuff you can do. Um, there is a general rule of thumb that say if the expected values within the cells are less than five, chi-squares is not a good approximation. Uh, more or less, uh, I use Fisher's exact test. On, so if, if, if the numbers are high and you can still run Fisher's exact test, the, the statistics are almost identical for chi -squares. Maybe not identical, but they're very, very, very close. And the p-values are very, very, very close between chi-squares and Fisher's exact test. And Fisher's is exact. 
So it's, it's not an approximation, there's no normality, there's no n is infinity, that kind of stuff. It's, it's an exact p value, so I tend to use that. It is slightly more conservative, right? So um, if there is a true effect, but you have small sample sizes, it's not going to necessarily reject um, a null hypothesis as often. But when sample sizes get big, it requests. There is no hard and fast rule of thumb, but that's the one they give for test one. Is there a situation when you would avoid using the experimental parameter? Uh, sample size is too high, it says I can't calculate it. Because there are so many permutations. Or uh, sometimes, also, when you have a really large table, like a 10 by 10 table that you actually want to test, uh, I would say, though, that uh, unless you have a lot of data that fills in those cells, it's probably not going to be a good test either way. Right? So, and each test really depends on what categorizations you do. Right? So saying if you had low, medium, and high, and then recategorize low to this and high and medium together, that's a t different test. Right, but sometimes that's more relevant, or that's more more relevant depending on uh, how people fall into the categories you gave them. Um, can you do a sensitivity test? Oh, so uh, so there's a package called Rocker, R O C R, all caps. Um, there is. Uh, we're not going to necessarily touch on that, but Rock, Rocker will allow you to do that. Or P Rock is another another uh, package. So more or less, if you have binary outcomes and you have some sort of problem, some sort of prediction, right? Uh, you can send it into the rocker package, uh, get uh, uh, an ROC curve, an area under the curve, a partial area under the curve. You can do testing for curves, that kind of stuff. Rocker's ROC. ROC are all caps. And then there is, so I don't believe, I'm not sure if Rocker actually does that much testing, but the P Rock package definitely does testing between, for example, two areas of the curve. So let's say you have two tests, right? They gave in the lab and, you know, you have probabilities for each one of them, like for each person. And then you said, well, is this one better than that one based on area under the curve? That will do the testing. Alrighty, so uh, we have a statistics lab, I believe. Do we? I don't think. Actually, I don't think so because it'd be probably going over some more things. Let me just double check. No, I don't. I don't. I don't think that's actually because I know. I know we're gonna go over uh, some of the other labs. No. Okay. So. Statistics are always fun to digest, especially that fast. Um, but more or less, you know the statistics. Choosing the right test is not. The, this is not the class of telling you necessarily what test to choose. Um, but for the most part, uh, at least doing some of these standard statistical techniques, it should be rather straightforward. Um, also, then I think with the tie, with the broom package, it's nice to tidy things up, be able to get things in data sets, data frames. Because then, for example, let's say you did the correlation between purple line and orange line, and then the correlation test between purple line and banner line, and they're two data frames, then you can just start merging them and joining them with the commands we've already talked about, rather than having to make tables yourself kind of thing, right? Rather than having to convert that object to some sort of table, you can just start using left join, right join, inner join, full join, that kind of stuff, because they're now data frames. All right, uh, I say we take a uh, five to ten minute break, uh, and then we'll regroup. Yes, uh, very briefly, yeah. Um, so, also, Andrew, uh, if you have any questions, do you have any questions about the uh, the project? Does everyone have some data? Okay, good. All right, so we'll meet back here in about five minutes, depending on the line, I guess, for the daily grind. Uh, so five to ten minutes.